this is some work we have been doing, you know, uh, with a lot of people from Intel. I mean, three of them over there. Some former Intel people, Sonica, uh, Sprint, and also ONF, you know, with Ping Ping and uh, a lot of people from ONF. Uh, so we'll give you a little bit of background uh, why we started the EPC, uh, what we now call, you know, NGIC. Uh, how does it fit into CORD? And, you know, what are our next, uh, next steps with EPC? So we started, you know, a few years ago, actually, uh, with uh, at and uh, Sprint, some other company, NG40, it's traffic emulator, to uh, study what was, you know, an EPC uh, bottlenecks on the platform, right? What were the impact of the control plane on the data plane as you started to grow traffic for what we call uh, traditional architecture, where the control plane and the data plane are, you know, very uh, tied together on the same platform, right? And what we saw, you know, we actually had uh, real traffic uh, from these operators from various U.S. regions, uh, San Jose, uh, South Texas. We had like four or five uh, regions. So we were able to play, you know, uh, a real traffic. And what happened, uh, we see, you know, when the system starts to be loaded, right? Uh, you load the system, number of users, you know, traffic. Suddenly, the impact of the control plane is very, very significant on your data plane. You lose a lot of, uh, you know, throughput. And what happened then, you scale the system, right? You go from one system to another system, and you can scale your control plane, but suddenly you have, a, you know, uh, too big of a data plane, right? You have, you know, additional capacity that you will not be using, and the operators traditionally uh, to have, you know, extra capacity, right? That's, you know, a lot of uh, loss money, loss opportunity. So what they really wanted to have the ability to scale control and data independently, right? So we had some publications uh, at Landman where we, you know, fully describe all the detail uh, of the measurement. I'll show you next slide also uh, how the system looked like. Right? Uh, on the top left corner, uh, this was the cluster uh, we had, again, you know, a uh, real machine, uh, real traffic being emulated with NG40 uh, traffic emulator, right? And going back and forth to the network. These are some of the network characteristics or traffic characteristics uh, of the system. And what you see at the bottom uh, left, the graph, on the left side, uh, it's basically the data plane. And you could see that when we scale the data plane from one to four data plane, we scale throughput, you know, Linearly, right? We go from, uh, you know, uh, 5 million packets per second to uh, 20 million by multiplying the servers, right? So fairly uh, linear scaling. However, on the control plane, we couldn't have this, right? We scale the control plane, but we don't have, you know, a linear uh, scalability, right? Again, as an end user, as an operator, I really want to scale uh, what they need to scale, when they need to scale, right? So, out of this, we say, okay, uh, let's look you know, at something different, right? And that's what we call, you know, uh, NGIC. You know, what is it, right, and why? It's, you know, research and collaboration with uh, uh, operators as well as academic partners and ONF, right, where, you know, we put back into the community uh, what we have learned. So the software has been open source. Uh, out of this, you know, uh, we work on some feature inside DPDK, which is an Intel open source library. Uh, you know, how do you optimize lookup, for example, uh, using Kukuash or some type of, you know, a very efficient lookup. So everything is released uh, back into the community. Uh, from Intel point of view, uh, it's not a product and probably will never be one uh, from Intel, but maybe other people, you know, uh, want to productize uh, the software. It has been released, uh, and I'll show you after the component, uh, today, a portion of it is released uh, at uh, ONLab, at ONF, and more will be coming uh, over the next few months, right? But so, you know, what is uh, NGIC? So, you saw on the left-hand side, this was, you know, the traditional model, and we moved to the right-hand side. Uh, you know, SDN was new, like, a few years ago, right, and interesting. So, we say, let's split, you know, control from data. And this is what we did, basically. We split, you know, uh, control, where we have the MME 
and the control plane terminate the S11 uh, you know, messaging, control messages. We can go through an SDN controller, I'll describe later, you know, or not. We can go directly from control uh, to data plane. And data plane just does, uh, so data plane, data plane pipeline, right? Now, on the data plane, you know, it's software, but it follows a match action semantic, very similar to what an open flow switch uh, would be doing. Uh, for example, that's why we also work on uh, optimizing lookup on the general purpose uh, architecture using this Kukuash uh, lookup technique, which are very efficient uh, to look up without having to degrade, you know, performance as you have, you know, million and million of entries. Uh, we had, again, an independent and scalable control and data. So we could scale one without the other. We could have two control plane, one at the plane, or vice versa, you know, N by M, right? And, you know, most importantly for us, this uh, supports the requirement of an operator, in this case, Sprint, right? So the data plane, I don't know if you looked at the EPC, you know, 3GPP specification, you know, it's uh, a lot of pages, but the operator, at the end of the day, they use maybe 10 or 15% of it, right? So in this case, we had specific requirements for specific usage model uh, on IoT uh, from Sprint, and this is what we'll, uh, we'll uh, provide. So what do we have? Um, so at the bottom, you have the data plane, and we have about you know, uh, six or seven stages processing on the pipeline. Uh, and cap, decap, rule identification, bearer mapping, uh, charging, we should charge record, IP forward, right? On the downlink, you have you know, data downlink notification for IoT. Your IoT device probably went back to sleep. You need to wake them up to send traffic. So this is what happened uh, on the data plane. Uh, that's a DPDK based data plane. Again, DPDK is this uh, fairly efficient IO library from Intel, uh, bypassing the kernel stack that you're in, in user mode. Uh, so that's a DPDK based uh, user plane. Then we have an SDN controller. Actually, we have a couple of SDN controllers. Uh, one by Sprint, uh, which has been released into uh, Open Daylight. And now there is also uh, ONF working on the ONOS one. Verizon started uh, the ONOS uh, project, and you know, ONF now, Sprint and Intel are working on it. So we have two uh, SDN controllers available and the control plane. So all of this from the control plane down uh, has been released, uh, is available on the, on the repository, uh, along with some test cases. And actually, next session, there is some uh, hands-on uh, tutorial on how to run this, uh, you know, with some pickup files, but you know, you'll be able to uh, run the control, run the data plane, and see traffic uh, going through uh, in containers. Uh, all this run in, you know, whatever uh, mode or shape you want. It runs as, you know, processes bare metal on bare metal um, servers, run as VMs, or run as containers, right? So it's no, uh, it's your choice, right? Now you see some uh, that on top with some square HSS, MME, and PCRF. And this will be released uh, next. The next one coming is the MME, which we started with uh, Radisys open source MME uh, in ON Lab. This was release 8. It's being brought up to release 12 or 13 uh, by Sprint and uh, Intel. And it should be available before the end of the year, right? So we'll put this back uh, into the community. And then over Q1, uh, probably HSS and PCRF. HSS started from uh, OAI, using the OAI uh, available one with a lot of modifications, a lot of optimization uh, on how to access the database and, and everything. So you know, by uh, the end of Q1, uh, we should have uh, all these components uh, available, right? So you have an EPC, uh, functional EPC uh, available, at least, you know, a, a good baseline. Of course, you know, uh, we're missing uh, features, a lot of features. And that's where maybe, you know, having members of the community interested to come and provide uh, features would be great, right? And you could add, you know, your own. Right? Are there any questions? No? Okay. Uh, 
status of the ONOS work to get this working with the ONOS control? Uh, ONOS work, maybe I can ask Ping Ping. Uh, uh, <laughs> Do you know the status of the ONOS work? We started uh, to move the FPC into ONOS, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you can see also what's available. You know, if you take a look at, you will see the functionality. Uh, basically, uh, the SDN controller is implementing what we call FPC, uh, forwarding and policy control, which is being defined uh, in the IETF uh, DMM, the Distributed uh, Mobility Management Group. Right. So they're implementing the the RFCs. Uh, communication between the if you're on the control plane and the SDN controller, you'll see the IETF DMM, it's you know, a data model. Right? And between the SDN controller and the data plane to fill up the table, we started using uh, OpenFlow 1.3 uh, a few months ago, but we had to add a lot of uh, vendors extension to support billing and to support you know, various uh, aspects, which at the time uh, were not available in OpenFlow. Uh, the operator sprint uh, was not very comfortable uh, with all these vendors' extensions. And we moved to uh, zero MQ, which is you know, a transport. But we could, we could go over any transport, right? We are transport agnostic. Yeah. Uh, can you comment on the separation of the data plane and user plane, the way we are seeing it here? How does it differ from the CGPP release 15? They are also talking. Right, they're talking about COPS, right? Uh, COPS, uh, control and user plane separation, right? Which is similar here. We, we didn't do all the you know S X A S X B S X C interfaces uh, that Cubs define, right? We have you know our own interface here, but it could be easily extended to uh, to meet you know uh, the Cubs requirement, right? So would it differ the way the separation is done? Would it be different in uh, here as opposed to the uh, release? Yeah. We are sort of new into this, so we are not sure what do you need to do. Well, I mean, uh, 3GPP mainly define interface functionality uh, inside the box. It's up to you to provide it the way uh, you want to provide it, right? Uh, so here, you know, we have a set of functionality on the data plane, again, as requested by the operators uh, we're working with to provide, you know, charging, rule mapping, uh, uh, I mean, better mapping, rule identification, right? Now, the way you talk between control and data plane, that's a lot of what, you know, uh, 3GPP defines through this set of interfaces, right? So here we don't have SXA, SXB, SXC, but, you know, we have similar type of interfaces and, you know, once finalized, we could move to them, we can implement them, right? So at this point, are you looking for the help from uh, different vendors? Uh, right now, uh, Intel, RTC, and Sprint are working on the yellow blocks. But you know, as they are becoming, uh, when they are open source, we welcome any help, right? And same on the data plane. For example, you know, one missing feature here is a network initiated bearer. If you want to support Volti, you need this type of capability. Uh, today, for the usage model we have, we don't need this. But if you want to provide it. Uh, please, we will we'll welcome your contribution. So by Q1, can we expect that we'll have all the elements we see here to be in open source form? Yes. So Q1 is out, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, some, you know, some performance about what you saw here, right? Um, so you saw the pipeline, the data plane pipeline, right? And what we call here packet processing core, it's one CPU core processing this full. The system requires for the core for handling R for the interfaces. Then we have core uh, data plane pipeline, right? And you can see that, you know, uh, for half a million subscribers, you know, 500,000 UEs, uh, we sustain about you know 1.7 million packets per second uh, on one core. As you add core, we scale. 
right? So, you know, four cores, it's about, you know, seven million uh, packets per second. And the core does, you know, all the processing, you know, packet gateway, uh, uh, S gateway, child protection, you know, uh, some static firewall rules, right? Uh, this is one model of the architecture. I don't know, maybe I can go back a little bit. You can do this also whatever way you want, right? Uh, let me give you maybe two examples. Uh, today we have done this, uh, calling it a, a pipeline model, where we have multiple CPU core, maybe one CPU core that's three of this guy, another guy that's three of this guy, working across rings. That's one model. We also have a model where you do run to completion. A single core, you get the data out of the NIC, the NIC RSS the data, basically hash the, the incoming uh, traffic, put them into specific queues, and the CPU will process from the time it receives the packet, all the packet out. This optimizes uh, cache uh, lookup. There is no cache trashing among, among core. So you can do whatever you want. It's very flexible. Like you kind of almost scale linearly by adding the core. Yes. Right? Uh, does that mean you really don't have any kind of a common resource? You need any concurrency control between those cores? Or it's just set up in such a way? Well, with, I mean, of course, there are some shared resources as you scale across core, right? For the size of the subscriber here, half a million subscribers, maybe we don't hit some of these issues, right? If you go to one million subscribers, maybe to get up, you know, and you're gonna start the shared road. Yeah. The cause and the set of shared that they have to share. But so, you know, we don't scale indefinitely, right? Uh, maybe when you reach uh, eight, 10, or 12 core, we can see some of these, uh, you know, uh, tapering out due to uh, shared resources interactions. Christian? Sorry, your previous comment, um, did you say that you use a run to completion model for the various elements in your... Uh... We use run, run to completion from uh, here to here. Could be an option. Today we have we have been working with two of them. One is a uh, you know pipeline, so we cut this into uh, let's say two or three uh, uh, segments. Have a queue in between, and, you know, different core get that uh, So the impact of this, you know, when you go from one core to the other, there is some uh, lowest level cache, you know, cache trashing. Uh, operations. Otherwise, we uh, take the data out of the NIC, we RSS out of the NIC into specific queues. The core takes data from the queues and go all the way through uh, the transmitter, right? But we could investigate, you know, multiple ways uh, of doing it. Yeah, there are there are some logs and there are some you know shared shared data also, right? Um, yeah. How extensible is the, the sort of service graph that can be applied on on the S gateway? Is it is it easy to add elements in? Is that fixed at runtime? Like how how are things like? Are, are different blocks added? Let me ask Jacob here. Yeah. For this, I mean, you could add a firewall or not, you know, and change them, you know, outside of this process, right? But this process, yeah, right now you compile the stuff in. So if, like, a private LTE or someone wanted to have, like, eliminate the charging block or... Yes. But if you want to make this dynamic, we will welcome your help. Okay. <laughs> okay. So these are some uh, that are again. Uh, this is a bit by print. 
back at the NAV World Congress, uh, we have optimized the data since, right? We, we're getting, you know, better, uh, better performance. And we continue to fine tune the, the pipeline. So, you know, now we have an EPC. Uh, it's running, uh, uh, again, as bare metal, VM or container, right? Uh, it runs by itself. Uh, it's actually available as is on the one of the ON Lab uh, rack. We made it available. You can log in and uh, you can exercise with the NG40 uh, traffic generator, right? Now, the next question is, you know, how do we move this uh, into Cord or into M Cord? Right? So I guess we can skip some of this slide, you know, third day Cord conference, but you know what Cord uh, is by now, right? Uh, let me skip some of these. Yeah, I will show you uh, some of the contribution we made in Cord. One is a EPC, and today it's fully orchestrated, you know, thanks to Ping Ping and, you know, all the ON Lab uh, crowd. We have worked also, I'll show you, on the infrastructure acceleration, how to accelerate, how to improve uh, court performance. And we added services uh, to the EPC, one being, you know, MRAT, multi-radio access technology. We have a device which is, you know, both Wi-Fi and LTE, and seamlessly uh, from one carrier to the other. Uh, so I see some work we did uh, this time with uh, Sprint, Spirant, uh, ONF, and Intel, right? So what do we have? Uh, well, we have the VMs, a couple of VMs, you know, the control plane is a VM, uh, the data plane is a VM, uh, the MME also uh, is a VM. And in this case, you know, they are fed by uh, Spirant uh, virtual landslide, right? So Spirant generate traffic. Now, uh, traffic goes through, right? Goes through uh, an application server, back and forth, right? So over this year, uh, the first time it was, I think, it, uh, yeah, for uh, ONS in April, we did build this uh, by hand using the GUI. So using the GUI, we created network slices. We instantiated the VM, right? We stitched them together, and traffic was flowing through, right? By... Um, by Mobile World Congress uh, in September, we started to use XOS to automate some of this process. So XOS, we are you know, creating the slices, creating the virtual network, but then we, by hand, you know, uh, did instantiate uh, the VM and run traffic through. And by uh, Cord Build, actually just maybe two days ago, uh, they're able to fully automate uh, with XOS. So XOS, you know, now, on top of the previously created network slices and you know and VM instantiate and you know stitch them together and traffic goes through right so you start to have you know a fully automated EPC uh, what Guru referred to as uh, EPC as a service right you you can launch uh, everything with uh, you know XOS and the, the Tosca files uh, we have learned you know a lot and there are some limitations uh, some you know uh, that we need to work on for example, here in this case, uh, you uh, what's in code here are the EPC component, but not the application server or not the Spirant uh, traffic generator. These guys are outside of the code environment, meaning code doesn't know their IP addresses, their public IP addresses. So we had to go and you know uh, play with some uh, various network type uh, inside uh, code uh, and on us to you know force some IP addresses or have some. Uh, static ARP addresses. Basically, we miss a virtual router, which will automatically, you know, uh, forward the traffic inside and set the tables uh, on the fabric uh, to carry the traffic to the compute node. So these are some of limitation uh, that we see today. I think you're going to see this working in the ONF booth, right, Ping Ping? So if you stop, by the way, I mean, there are like two booths outside, one for Intel, you can see the EPC running, uh, and one ONF, where you see, you know, EPC under the core environment, right? This gives you some, uh, you know, logical uh, connectivities uh, inside code, right? How the different VM uh, are connected, what kind of networks are being created, right? 
here you see uh, the physical connectivity, right? Each VM exposes uh, a set of you know, uh, virtual interfaces, uh, plug the vSwitch, and here we support, at least to date, uh, from uh, a call as well as uh, OVS DPDK. And I'll mention a little bit later what kind of difference uh, this brings, right? Right, next slide. So today you install Cord with uh, OVS. And OVS, you know, is very, very flexible, uh, support a lot of features, but it has some uh, limitation for throughput, right? It's fairly limited in terms of uh, throughput. So some of the work we did uh, was to move with uh, OVS DPDK. OVS DPDK still uses OVS for the you know, flow uh, lookup and everything, but it's using DPDK for the IO aspect of it, right? And so I work with uh, Andy here, sorry. Uh, I've been a bunch of uh, JRAs to modify the various uh, components of the system to try to enable OVS DPDK as an alternate switch, right? And today uh, it's available with some, with some configuration uh, keyword, uh, right? And, that, and so, you know, what does this bring, right? Let's go now uh, in terms of performance, right? Uh, you saw this this morning, you know, briefly. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see the cord infrastructure with, uh, you take a default VNF doing L2 forward or L3 forward, and we run it into cord, and we get the orange line, basically, a throughput. It's about two to 300,000 packets per second at 64 bytes, right? The same VNF with uh, OVS DPDK, we get close to you know, three and a half million packets per second. Right? On the right-hand side, you see the latency and jitter aspect. Uh, latency is you know, higher uh, with the orange and the jitter go, goes all over the place. With OVS DPDK, you have you know, much lower latency and the better jitter. There are still some points jumping, uh, jumping up, but you know, uh, overall, it's, it's, uh, it's much better. Right? Now, in addition to OVS DPDK, uh, there are a few stuff you need to do. Uh, you need to back your VM with huge pages. So the TLB, you know, the transaction side buffer doesn't get hit uh, a lot of time. Uh, your VM is using huge pages. You need to isolate your CPU where you're gonna run your VM from the operating system. You don't want the OS to schedule something on the CPU, right? You also want to uh, pin your VM to specific core, right? So it doesn't, again, get moved back and forth uh, by the OS, right? I know this set of, uh, it's just a configuration, right? It's available. Uh, you know, just the use of this best known method give you, you know, a significant performance, uh, performance boost. And for most of your VM, being you know, a VM having to deal with network traffic, you probably want you know, the highest performance possible. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, another uh, feature we did add to the EPC, right? Uh, we call this MRAT, multi-radio access technology. Uh, this is not open source today. Probably will be uh, by Q1 as we add feature. Right, which is an MRAT client. I support LTE and Wi-Fi. In the network on the SNP gateway, we have the control, uh, the either the device or the operator could. Now, this is an on the left side, it's an ITF specification. There is no more uh, 3GPP changes. We went multiple routes here. First, we tried to change the 3GPP UE. It was too difficult or too long. Uh, then we tried to make changes into the RAN. Similarly, it was too long. And then finally, you know, they said to on the ITF draft. So it's software you could download. It's a layer of software that you put on your client, and your client will do, you know, uh, seamless uh, switching back and forth between Wi-Fi or LTE. Uh, similarly, on the core of the network, you can have you know, a lot of, of functionality. Right? Today, we don't have all of them, but I can show you uh, briefly a demo here where you'll see the device switching back and forth. LTE. Right? Now, for this demo, we have been using uh, again, NG40 is a traffic emulator, uh, similarly to Spirant or Ixia. Uh, and we've been working with, uh, with this uh, three. Okay, let's see if it works. No. 
nữa Well, no. <laughs> but what you could see is the demo running, and maybe after I'll go by and make it running. Uh, you'll see the client again joining, you know, the two networks. Uh, you either have hundred percent of traffic on Wi-Fi. After some changes, you go, you get hundred percent of traffic on LTE or a mix. You decide, you know, the, the type of traffic you want to distribute uh, on which network. Uh, so, you know, a summary, NGSC is a uh, DK-based uh, EPC operating, you know, any mode of, of uh, any mode you want, right? Bare metal uh, in a VM container, or it's also being orchestrated uh, into cord. The other component, the missing component that you saw will be available uh, over time. The next one will be the MME, uh, coming probably before the end of the year, and the, the other two one by the end of... Uh, End of Q1, right? Next, uh, after this uh, session here, there will be a hands-on tutorial showing you how to run the EPC. If you want uh, to attend the tutorial, actually, there is there are no Wi-Fi connectivity, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, we have backup. We have videos. <laughs> But if you can connect with your you know, cellular network, you could uh, uh, start to download Docker and Docker Compose and get the images, control data, and, uh, and traffic. Uh, we also, on the, on the wiki, uh, put this at ONLab, right? So it, you need uh, to get the, to the NGIC going, right? Uh, using NGA40 and Spirant requires you know, a, lot of, uh, a lot of manipulation. It's not as straightforward. Uh, here with a pickup file, at least you could see uh, traffic going to the component. Right. So that's pretty much uh, for the slide. I'd be happy to take you know, uh, any questions. I have a slightly non-related question. This EPC, which, the open source EPC, which you're going to see based on DPDK, is, is that our expectation that companies like AT&T, Verizon, and they would adopt this, or with, they will go to Nokia, Ericsson, and those folks and get the NGIC from them. I don't know. Maybe we should ask. Uh, <laughs> we, we, would love, we would love to. I don't know. What. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. For us, you know, it's a reference implementation. I, uh, you know, either you or our firm or Nokia or Ericsson take a look at some of the techniques we have been using to get the performance and, and maybe use them, right? That's you know, new usage model. Large number of IoT devices. You know how do you change the keys and how do you authenticate them, right? So you know we use this tool to uh, to play with with a uh, few usage models, right? Uh, again, we are not making a product; we're making it available uh, to the community. Just like this. A lot of things from this, then mm -hmm. you could use the same technique mm -hmm. for uh, bigger operators. Like yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Someone, yeah. We're not doing system integration, and we're not doing uh, product out of this. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Or? Have you have you tested not uh, not so much the data plane scalability, but the control plane scalability in terms of you know devices? Coming on and going, or moving between cells, and all that sort of control planes. Yeah, we have tested, you know, uh, coming and going. Definitely, uh, it has been tested also with real uh, uh, Nokia E Node B uh, tower to communicate through the tower. Uh, we have not fully tested uh, mobility. We tested mobility with NG40, you know, as an emulator, uh, not in the field, right? But we know traffic uh, using uh, three emulator. I mean, uh, NG40. Uh, Spirant, Ixia, as well as real uh, Nokia, 
uh, tower traffic has been flowing through the through the, the software. Now, of course, we had to fix issues uh, with. Yeah, you know, I just want to uh, like scalability-wise in terms of I guess down through an SDN controller and then signaling to the data plane. Are there any? Yes. Yeah, we have seen, you know, a lot of, um, without the controller, having the control to data plane, we had, I think, 50K or 60K transaction per second. We're nowhere near that with the SDN controller in the middle. Right, so maybe a tenth of, uh, of that, right? So the component themselves, you know, can handle very high transaction rate. When you go through an SDN controller, suddenly you're, uh, you're much more limited, right? And that's why we do support both models, right? We want to show the capability of the software and then you know, where is the, the choking point in the system. And today the choking point is, uh, is uh, the SDN controller. Yeah. So maybe one more question then on, um, uh, is, there, is there any thought on when you, when you get this into uh, a shared data layer or um, you know, user data repositories, so that would be more like 5G-like. Um, mm -hmm. Are there some learnings already on, on that end? Yes, you mean for the 5G architecture? When we move and when some of these components becomes, uh, I guess, microservices or from component to component? We are, we are investigating, uh, you know, a lot of the communication and how to optimize uh, communication, you know, whether it's RESTConf or any other uh, Swagart stuff. Uh, between components, yes, definitely. But there aren't any learnings right now. Yeah, maybe early, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>